God's great rescue plan. God's great rescue plan. And see, this world was in need. Oh, God's amazing rescue plan is what it is. Awesome. Oh, there we go. (laughs) I had my own series wrong. I love it. Um, (laughs) God's amazing rescue plan. Um, But see, the world was in need of a savior because the world was full of sin. But God's amazing rescue plan didn't go into effect because just because the world was was worse than God originally thought it was going to be. God's amazing rescue plan was that he had this in mind since the beginning back in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 right at the beginning of the Bible. And God's amazing rescue plan culminates on Easter Sunday because we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and we recognize him we recognize from his resurrection that he truly did and does have power over the enemy and we recognize that we can have new life with Jesus as we begin that relationship with him. Now, however, before we get too much into Easter Sunday talk, we will want to take a few stories over the next few weeks and uh, focus on looking into Jesus' ministry that he had here on earth. Now, today we're going to be talking about the story of Jesus with the woman at the well. Uh, You can turn to John chapter 4, verse 7. I'll be in the English Standard Version, John chapter 4, verse 7. You can also follow along in the YouVersion Bible app by, first of all, opening the app and then clicking on the tab that says More, and then clicking on Events, and then you can search our church, and you can follow along right in the notes there. Um, I was actually, uh, uh, I see Natalie Knowlton here this morning. I was talking to you a few weeks ago. She said that all the notes that you take in that app, you can look back on from weeks prior uh, if you ever wanted to review something. Uh, how many remember every message that I've ever preached? Raise your hand. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but you can look back into those notes and uh, see what notes you took and uh, whatever you, uh, you want as far as growing in your relationship with God, maybe for devotionals throughout the week as well. Uh, so, uh, this was actually news to me that you could look back on notes because I'm not taking notes on my message while I'm up here because I have them, you know, right in front of me. So, uh, great opportunity, great tool, and along with that, if you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles right ahead of you unless you're in the front row. Uh, so, you three in the front row, you can look behind you or underneath your seat <laughs> and you'll find a Bible there too. Um, here at our church... Look, if you've been here before, you've heard this many times, but we say this all the time. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to come here, okay? But we do ask that you are a biblical student of God's Word, basically meaning this, that you're willing just to learn more about what the Bible says and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you as you read, okay? So if you are using those pew Bibles and you're unfamiliar with navigating the Bible, we encourage you to turn to page 1056 as that's where we'll be in those pew Bibles today. So John 4, this is the story of the woman at the well, and at this moment in Jesus' ministry, he's taking a break as he was tired from the journey that they were on. And so he took a seat at this well. Scripture says that it was about noon, and and he was probably very tired because it was the heat of the day at this time at noon. So let's take a look. John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, it says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Okay, so here is Jesus in the heat of the day. And he comes to this woman to draw water from the well, and and Jesus is asking her for a drink, And right? So take note here that the disciples were not with Jesus as they had gone into town to go grocery shopping, okay? They went into uh, the Samaritan or the Jewish Aldi back then, and so they went shopping. That was a joke. You can laugh. It's okay. Uh, Scripture says that they went to get food, okay? So this woman acts very surprised because she knows that Jews did not associate with Samaritans, okay? Our middle schoolers in the room know what this is like, okay? At school, whether it's right or wrong, there are kids that are on just, there are some kids that are more popular than others, okay? For whatever reason, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's sports or academics or whatever it is, even in high school, it happens as well, but sometimes it seems that the popular kids just don't hang around the unpopular kids, right? Is it right? No, but we all, we all know that it happens in school, okay? So imagine for a moment being one of those unpopular kids 
which really isn't too difficult for me to imagine because that was just my reality when I was in middle school and high school, not being a popular kid, so I can just place myself in those shoes with no problem. But I didn't play sports. I wasn't involved with the, with the cool kids, so to speak. I was a band kid. In fact, I spent most of my high school career in the band room. I remember uh, one, of my, uh, one of my last year, I think it was my senior year in high school, that um, I did a, a concert band class, I did a jazz band class, I, did, I was in study hall in there, I was there for lunch, I was there before school and after school, it's just the way it was for me, um, and although I was not very popular, I really did enjoy uh, my high school years. But imagine yourself as an unpopular kid waiting for a ride from your parents after school, okay, and a popular kid comes out of the building and says, hey, could you give me a ride home? My parents, you know, my parents aren't available, and you know, and now I need to ride home. Would you be willing to do that? Right? You'd, be, you'd be pretty astounded, right? Someone who's so popular, so to speak, is talking to you. And not only that, they want a favor from you? This just seems really odd. And at first, I'd maybe think that there's an ulterior motive. What is this kid trying to do? And who put him up to this, right? That's what I would be thinking. Um, but you'd say, you know... You think, why, why are you talking to me? You've never talked to me a day in your life. I've seen you in passing in the hall, and you've always, you know, not even paid any attention to me. Well, this is the type of situation that Jesus is dealing with. Jew, Jews were seen as the higher society people, and Samaritans were seen as lower society. And here it is that Jesus is associating with the seemingly lower society. But as we entered into the series called God's Amaz- Amazing <laughs> Rescue Plan... Uh, we, I've got to do this all throughout my notes, so bear with me, because I thought it was God's great rescue plan. But we will find that Jesus isn't concerned with higher or lower class, with popular or unpopular, higher or lower society. He's concerned with the heart matters, and he's concerned with you. He wants to know you. He wants relationship with you for who you are. This is proven as we read Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 and 28, it says, For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus is revealing that the societal class that this woman at the well places herself in really doesn't matter to him as he asks her for a drink. I believe it's all a part of Jesus allowing barriers to be put aside as he's coming into this conversation, right? That verse 10 said, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The point number one that I want to make today is that Jesus offers relationship. Jesus offers relationship. And he is offering relationship here in this statement as he says that if she knew who he was, that he would ask him, that she would ask him for a drink. She is being offered the living water, and Jesus is hinting at the idea of offering her a relationship with him. Now, this isn't the type of relationship you automatically think of in the worldly sense of the word. And we're talking about a relationship with Jesus being this communion with God, being in a relationship with Jesus is coming into alignment with God, turning your life over to him to serve him all the days of your life. And When Jesus says this, this woman begins to question Jesus. John chapter 4, verse 11 says, The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Okay, see, Jesus has a habit of speaking in such a way that it makes people think. Whoever's up in the booth, that was awesome. I love that living water that you played there. That was great. Thank you for that. Um, So good, so good. But he makes people think. He, he makes people ask questions with different things that he says. And then um, he will sometimes explain what it means to some people and you know, sometimes not to others. But the woman asked Jesus if he was greater than their father Jacob, who gave them the well that they were sitting by. Right? Are you greater than, than Jacob? And she, she just didn't quite know how to take Jesus and what he was saying. Well, verses 13 to 14 says this. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. See, this is where it gets good because Jesus is starting to get more specific. He's beginning to reveal reveal more of God's amazing rescue plan for all of mankind as he says that the water she's trying to fetch with her pail 
will eventually become, will make her thirsty again, but the water that Jesus gives her will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. How many of you know this morning that Jesus was not talking about physical water as he was speaking? Jesus was talking about entering into relationship with him in such a way that we would never again thirst for the things of this world. And, and listen, all so often we're satisfied with the things of this world and we just continue to put garbage in our mind by endlessly scrolling through whatever social media it is or by being glued to the news screen, by being maybe caught in addiction with drugs or alcohol or pornography or maybe by associating ourselves with the wrong crowd and that, we, that, we, that crowd we know is drawing us away from God and sometimes we just miss what God is wanting to do in us and we're missing it. We, we have to keep going back sometimes. It seems that we just have to keep going back to the things of this world when we are going to things of the world because we always need, it seems, more of it because it doesn't satisfy. And so then you just go back day after day, still unsatisfied, still going back. But Jesus tells this woman, here's the turning point, that if she would take this living water, otherwise known as a relationship with Jesus Christ, she would never thirst again for the quote-unquote water or whatever it is of this world that this world offers. This bears the question for us this morning. How many of us in this room have come to church today drinking the water of the world and you're just sick of it, you're just tired of it? Maybe you don't know exactly what you were looking for and the things you've been hooked on, but you definitely know that you aren't happy. Well, you're in good hands today as you hear the message right here from Jesus out of John 4, because I encourage you today, and so does Jesus, to drink the living water that he offers, and you will be set free, you will be forgiven, you will be redeemed, and those chains of bondage will come off your life, and the guilt will be gone, and you'll be able to move forward in freedom as you begin that relationship with him. We look in verse 15 up here. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Right? She wants this water. She wants this relationship with Jesus. She's interested in what Jesus has to offer. And then Jesus asks her to go get her husband. Turn of events here. Well, listen, I was just looking for this water, this relationship. And, she says, and Jesus says, why don't you go get your husband? In John 4, 17 to 18 says, the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Second point I want to make today, Jesus reveals our hearts. Jesus reveals our hearts. In this moment, Jesus uncovers for her that he knows the life she is living she has had five husbands, and the one she's living with now is not her husband. And in society back then, living with someone before you were married was just not acceptable. If you did so, you were not viewed very well at all. And in today's day and age, living with someone before you're married has unfortunately become just acceptable in society. And I've heard it said that you've got to just test the waters to make sure that this marriage is going to work out. And when, when all reality... We believe that the Bible clearly teaches that living a life of purity is very important. We believe that living with someone before you're married truly can lead to a lot of kinds of difficulties spiritually, right? But does the Bible clearly state, don't live with your significant other before you're married? Does the Bible say that? No, it does not say that. But God's Word does teach the importance of living a life of purity, and we truly believe that to live a life of purity, you must guard your heart against sexual impurity. And no matter how strong we think we are, we're humans, and therefore living with the opposite gender before you're married can lead to temptations that you just don't want to experience. And Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. The scripture says, guard your heart. All right, so therefore, one of the things you can do to guard your heart and protect yourself from giving in to temptation is to not live with a significant other before you get married so that you can exemplify this Christian purity. God's word exemplifies the importance of the, of the sanctity of marriage. So I encourage you, if you find yourself living with your significant other today, right now, before you're married, I would be happy to meet with you and your significant other and just help you navigate how to take a turn in the right direction. Because we're all trying to help people here at this church. We want to help steer people in the right direction in their walk with Jesus. We can have a conversation together about it with no shame, no condemnation, 
just simply looking at options to seeing how we can steer you in the right direction in your relationship and help you on a path to purity. But as we see Jesus talking to this woman, he is revealing her heart and areas in which she might not really be happy. And Jesus, Jesus states that the man she's living with is, is not her husband. And, and she recognizes that this man is a prophet. John 4, 25 to 26 says, The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Point number three today, Jesus reveals himself. Okay, Jesus reveals himself. Jesus told her that he was the long-awaited Messiah and revealed who he really was to her. Jesus wants us to know who he really is. Okay, and, and this meant a lot to her because she wasn't living, a, she, was, she was living a life that she did not want to live and she was then going to be given this living water and she just couldn't contain herself. As we read in the next few verses, verses 28 and 29 says, so the woman left her jar and went away into town and said to people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Can this be the Christ at this moment? Get this. She believed in the Lord Jesus. She believed in the Lord Jesus. And you might doubt this because she didn't pray a sinner's prayer and ask for forgiveness. We didn't read the altar call. Okay? We didn't read about that. But here's the thing. I think we have it harder. I really do. I think we have it harder because, because Jesus right now isn't walking around in the form of a man nowadays. Okay? Jesus was walking around back then and this woman had an experience with him. But this woman... She was in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And because she was with him, she believed his words about who he was and began to tell people all around her town who she had met and that he was the Messiah. Okay? But, but wait a second. If she didn't take a class on evangelism, man, I don't know. Should she have been doing that? Now, she didn't get a doctorate in sharing her faith in evangelism. What's the deal with this? Right? She can't just be going around doing this. Now listen, I'm not knocking degrees and furthering your education. I'm in a master's degree right now in, in pastoral care and counseling myself. I think that degrees are very important and help us furthering our education. But this woman, without a degree, without this class, she became the first witness for Jesus. As she had an experience with him that she won't soon forget, and she told people about her Savior. It was right here that she believed in Jesus Christ as her Savior. She became a witness for Jesus. She received the living water, and I'll bet you that she never thirsted again. She was formerly searching for love in all of the wrong places, living with men she wasn't married to, trying to find true love in the form of a human being. But in this moment, she received the love of a father, her heavenly father, as she loved Jesus. She was given the living water that she needed. Do you see what Jesus did? Look carefully at what Jesus did. He did not condemn her to hell because of her sin. But he walked with the woman in her pain, brought up some things that, yes, were sin, and pointed her to the truth. This is an amazing example today for our witness to other people who aren't believers in Jesus. This is exactly how we should be approaching Christian witnessing. We can't have the joyful message of grace without mentioning sin. It's not the popular way to go, but we are separated from God without Jesus, and that's what makes grace so amazing. It brings us into a relationship with Jesus. It brings us into a relationship with Jesus. And I truly believe that the three points we discussed this morning right out of Scripture are all a part of God's amazing rescue plan. Number one, Jesus offers relationship. Number two, Jesus reveals our heart. And number three, Jesus reveals himself. And not necessarily all in that order. It sometimes is in a different order. looks differently with different people. But I believe that all three of these items are things that Jesus does to bring us into relationship with him. Uh, and today as we close, I'm going to ask Kendra to come forward to the piano and uh, we're going to close with a time of worship in just a few moments. Um, I'd also like to ask our deacons to come forward, deacons and spouses, if you can come forward as we just have a time of prayer. And as we do this this, this morning, would you stand as we, as we end? Today, as we talk about God's amazing rescue plan, you might find yourself in the same situation as, as the woman at the well. 
you might find yourself in the same situation. Uh, but today we have our deacons in front. In a few moments they're, they're coming and they're, they're going to be able to pray with you if you desire prayer today. Listen, maybe you've been searching for your sustenance or your livelihood in the things of this world and you've found that they really just aren't satisfying anymore. Maybe you're done trying to figure out life on your own. And if you want this living water that will allow you to never thirst again, I invite you to come forward and receive what God would have for you today. Because listen, the Bible says we've all screwed up, all of us, everyone, none of us that has entered this room today has lived a perfect life. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the perfect day to do so. All the mistakes you've made, all the sin you've been involved in can be washed away as you come into relationship and new life with Jesus. All of it can be washed away. You can be clean. You can be made new. You can be made right. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The new has come. So today, if you want to be a new creation, if you want to restart your life and start out fresh, you can accept God's call into being a new creation. If you want to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to come forward and meet with any one of our deacons or myself this morning in the front. We simply will lead you through a prayer to come into relationship with Jesus and give you more information about where to go from there. Today, this is a call to come forward and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, either for the first time or recommitment in your life to Jesus. And I also want to encourage you today, if there's another prayer need that you have during this time that you just want prayer for, you're welcome to come forward, okay? It doesn't just have to be people coming forward to accept Christ. If you just need prayer, if you're just feeling defeated, if you're just feeling down, if you're in need of a miracle, whatever that looks like for you today, come forward. You can either pray with us, you can kneel down at the altar and pray by yourself. Let this time be a free moment where you spend reflecting on what God wants to do in and through you, okay? Let this be a time where you reflect on what God wants for you. And seriously, don't shy away from this opportunity Jesus has for you. Come and be a new creation this morning. Allow God to work in your life in this way. Kendra, she's going to lead us in uh, worship to close. And in just a few minutes, I'll pray as we, uh, as we close our service together. Let's pray. Let's worship today. I've heard a thousand stories of what they in the congregation that God's laying on your heart to pray for. Go and take this time. Feel free to go pray with somebody. Let's continue to turn this time of worship. Let's continue to turn this time into a moment of prayer that we all encounter God. 
let's take this time and continue to pray, continue to go after the Lord in prayer and worship. that is thirsting for this living water that Jesus is so freely offering, I pray that they would accept it. I pray that they would accept it this morning and truly come into relationship with you. Jesus, I pray that you would guide us as we go throughout the week, this week. I pray, Lord, that you bring us back here safely when we return. But Lord, I also pray that you would empower us to be disciple makers in this world. I pray that we would be obedient whenever you ask us to go pray with somebody or go tell somebody about Jesus. Help us to be bold. Help us to say yes. Help us to make the decision to say yes even before we leave this church. God, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you. We pray that you go with us as we leave. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming to church today.